to see you all. Um, yeah, also hi to everybody online. Uh, yeah, I, I want to say a few words about a relatively recent results on um, something I've been working on uh, for a while, which is gauge theory, symmetries, anomalies, and how it all comes together in quantum theory. So this is based on a joint paper with uh, Romeo Brunetti, Michel Dutch, and Klaus Freinhagen. Um, sorry, that, that one screen is showing something else than the other, but I assume that I can ignore it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the paper can be found on the archive. Um, and I will start with a very gentle introduction uh, motivating the whole approach to quantum field theory, which I'm pursuing. And uh, then I'm going to talk about a particular construction that was uh, proposed in that paper. Okay, so uh, the paper in question is called the Unitarian Master World Identity, Time Size Axiom, Nether's Theorem and Anomalies. So here I want to focus on Nether's Theorem and Anomalies part. Um, and what we have shown in that paper conceptually was that one can take things from that we know from a quantum field theory uh, in general, like interactions, renormalization, anomalies, symmetries, and one can uh, put these things on nice mathematical uh, footing using my favorite framework of sister algebra. So uh, I will tell you a bit more about the background of this. And a very important uh, notion in that approach called algebraic quantum field theory is the notion of causality and causal structure. So this whole approach really intrinsically uh, lives on Lorentzian manifold. So one needs some notion of um, causality in order to be able to uh, formulate various statements. So first thing, I'm going to make a quick run through um, special relativity, general relativity, and causality. So uh, I assume that for most of you, this is obvious, but in case it isn't, or it's sort of obvious, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, give a little recap. So let's start with uh, special relativity. So, so there are going to be some words I'm going to use throughout this talk. So the first word is the causal structure. So imagine we, uh, do you see my cursor? Probably yes. Uh, so here at some point in space time, so here and now, um, and then you can draw a thing called the light cone. So this is something I drew here in yellow. So uh, the equation, well, I'm looking at the two dimensional model here because I have only two dimensions available uh, to show you. Um, the light cone is given by this equation. So uh, the change of time is equal to the change of space in appropriate uh, units where the velocity of time is equal to one because I'm a mathematical physicist, so I'm using these units always. Um, and then you can talk about space-like directions. So this is the red arrow. So these are all the things that are space-like to us that are happening elsewhere. So uh, for example, my colleagues who are now in York are space-like to me. Um, future pointing and past pointing. So this arrow is the future of here and now. So hopefully uh, Q&A session, pub and dinner and past pointing is, uh, well, everything that led to this wonderful event. So in particular, me driving from uh, York to Oxford. Okay, um, so these are these various directions and I split uh, my space time into these various regions. So space like, is elsewhere, past and future. It's something which affects me or I can affect by what's going on at this point in space then. Right, so um, that's all easy, right? You can uh, now formulate it with a bit of uh, algebra. So you can represent those directions in two dimensions as vectors. Uh, you can then say that this equation of the light cone can also be written as follows. So the difference of squares of um, position coordinate and time coordinate is zero. Uh, and then you can formulate these conditions for being um, time-like, space-like, and uh, light-like, so now, um, as you can see here. 
And this then allows one to uh, write it even nicer. So you can introduce a two by two matrix with one minus one on the diagonal, uh, which is the Minkowski metric in two dimensions. And then there's a nice succinct way of writing the light cone equation. So just feed your uh, vector coordinates into your metric. Um, so that's in two dimensions. Now, if we want to talk about uh, more dimensions, well, we add more space dimensions, so there will be more ones on the diagonal. And in particular, I want to uh, focus on the four dimensional situation. Okay, um, now uh, let's go from special relativity to general relativity. So let's leave uh, R to the fourth uh, behind. So Minkowski space time uh, can be generalized to uh, something uh, better, namely a manifold. And here, well, uh, I assume that, well, most of you, if not all of you, know what's a manifold, uh, but basically it's something which locally looks like R4. So at every point you can uh, find the neighborhood and map it into a neighborhood in R4. And a simplest example of that is a circle. That's a nice manifold where intervals can be mapped to intervals in R. And then you also have a thing called tangent space. So directions in uh, the manifold can be uh, form a vector space, uh, which is called the tangent space. Um, okay, and here is a two-dimensional example. So you have uh, something with a hole in it, uh, and you have a tangent space, which is now two-dimensional. So these are the basic notions. So uh, manifolds, uh, tangent space, and obviously uh, now the metric also gets generalized to uh, something that can change from point to point. So in general relativity, we replaced this Minkowski metric, which was just a matrix with everything um, the same at every point with um, an arbitrary metric, which assigns to each point a four by four matrix has to do it in a smooth way. So this changes nicely across uh, the space time, uh, but it can look very differently at different points. So. Uh, at each point, then you can use this met metric to um, define a light cone, to construct the light cone at that point. So at each point, you know which direction is space and which direction is time. And this is, uh, well, not as simple as it sounds actually, because here is a very standard example, uh, a sketch of uh, what uh, a black hole would look like. So here, uh, after crossing, some boundary called the event horizon, what is uh, time uh, well, suddenly changes into space. So for this guy here, uh, time is up and space is left and right. And then uh, if you fall into the black hole uh, by accident, then um, what well, time is left and uh, space lag is, is up. Um, so there's no much possibilities for you to get out. Uh, so that's an extreme example of uh, the fact that causal structure can sometimes be a bit counterintuitive in uh, curved space time. Uh, but what counts for us is that at each point, we can actually decide uh, what's uh, space time, what's future, what's past. So uh, now for each curve in space time, I can now ask myself um, our is the tangent vector to that curve uh, one of these distinguished classes? So time-like, space-like, uh, light-like. And uh, I can write these conditions using the metric. So uh, I can talk about space-like curves, time-like curves, light-like curves, and causal curves, which is either light-like or time-like. So this is uh, the structure I get in every Lorentzian manifold knowing the metric. Uh, and then an important principle of general relativity tells us that observers move on time-like curves. Um, so in a sense, the metric tells us uh, what are the allowed directions to uh, go, to evolve into. 
Okay, that was a very crash course. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Because if there are, then I should answer them now before we go to uh, more interesting stuff. Okay, great. So uh, now quantum, I want to take that story and kind of combine it with quantum theory. So let's start with quantum mechanics. And um, th there are, I would say, maybe two main ways of looking at quantum mechanics. So my favorite way is uh, what was formulated by von Heisenberg and Jordan in 1925 in uh, the famous Dreimänner Arbeit, which uh, uses kind of matrix formulation um, of quantum mechanics. So this was uh, the beginning of um, what's now understood as operator algebraic approach to quantum mechanics. So this focuses on operators, on operator algebras, rather than Hilbert spaces. Uh, at the same time, well, more or less, um, Schrodinger uh, came up with another formulation in terms of wave <laughs> mechanics, uh, which is also great. And I think, well, in the sense, uh, it gained more popularity over time. However, for oh, um, various reasons, I would rather stick with this operator algebraic approach. So um, in quantum mechanics, you have these two formulations. And now you can ask yourself, well, all right. So now we want to combine quantum mechanics with um, special and general relativity. So what do we do? OK, so mathematical notions that uh, I kind of associate with quantum are Hilbert spaces states operators, and I especially focus on operators. Um, what I want to describe in uh, my theory is uh, essentially physics behind uh, particle physics experiments. So um, quantum field theory really intrinsically uh, was mostly tested in the situations where you have scattering of particles. And well, these are situations where things have very high energies or moving at very high uh, velocities. So uh, you expect the relativistic effects to come into place of so special relativity is definitely uh, in the game and some quantum. Um, so yeah, so in order to describe experiments happening say in CERN, um, you need the theory which combines the two. Um, and this is quantum field theory. Um, so in a sense, you can say that quantum field theory is a framework which combines special relativity with quantum mechanics. That's how I want to think about it. Um, so I want to take the concepts I introduced up to now and combine them in one framework. So from special relativity, I want to take causality. Uh, I want to take the causal structure of Minkowski spacetime and uh, more generally of a Lorentzian manifold and these notions of future, past, and being space like. Okay, and from quantum mechanics, I want to talk about observables. So, and I want to think of these observables as elements of a certain operator algebra. So, this is algebraic approach to quantum mechanics. And then on that algebra, I will also have states. Having states, I can compute expectation values, correlations, entanglements. So there's like that whole story coming later. But in the first instance, I want to have operator algebras. So uh, yeah, so the first level of uh, abstraction. So instead of thinking about bounded operators on, on a given Hilbert space, I want to think of this more abstractly. So more abstractly, bounded operators on a Hilbert space are a sister algebra, okay? So uh, I want to forget about that concrete Hilbert space and just talk about the operator algebra um, of my observables as a sister algebra. This will be important in this talk. And then uh, I want to assign these operators to uh, regions of spacetime in a way which is compatible with causality. So I want to localize my operators. I want to localize my observables. And then I can talk about um, 
well, various notions related to causality. So this is the main idea. Yes, please. I think well, in quantum mechanics, the operators are usually unbounded with dense domains. Like that, that, that is correct. So um, the, well, the assumption here is that all the physical information can be encoded in some space of bounded operators. And then uh, from that, uh, given a particular representation, you can also get unbounded operators. So if you want to think about a concrete example, you have, uh, say, uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, you can have position and momenta operators, which are unbounded, but then you can look at the Weyl algebra, which is sort of exponentiation of these unbounded operators, and these are bounded. Okay, so in my way of thinking here, um, I'm really going to think about exponentiated unbounded operators as a sort of generators of everything I have in my theory. Okay, so, um, and later on, you will explicitly see some exponentials actually. So um, I'm working with bounded operators, but then, uh, yeah, this could be, uh, just exponentials of things you know. Oh, so that's a very good question, thank you. Uh, anything else at this point? All right, uh, cool. So here is algebraic quantum field theory. Um, this is uh, the, the, my favorite framework for quantum field theory. Uh, this goes back to Hagen Kessler uh, to the 60s, and it started as an axiomatic framework in uh, Minkowski space then. So one assigns two uh, bounded regions O in Minkowski space then uh, algebras of observables that can be localized in uh, such regions. So you have an assignment of A of O to O and um, there is a notion of subsystems. So if you have a uh, a smaller region inside larger region, then, well, the smaller algebra sits inside larger algebra. So this is one of uh, the axioms that one uh, requires for such an assignment of algebras to regions, but there are more. And the first and foremost is the causality. So as I said, um, well, there's this principle in special relativity that nothing moves faster than light, hence things that are space-like separated, so they're connected, cannot be connected by the causal curve, uh, they have to be in some sense independent, right? So that is the causality. And one of the axioms is that observables localized in space-like regions are um, independent. So um, in the more, uh, operator algebraic uh, setting or more quantum mechanics setting, independent meaning that uh, the operators commute. So if I have A of O1 and A of O2, O1 is space like to O2, then their algebras commute. And there's another one uh, which I want to mention, but maybe not elaborate too much upon. So this is the time size axiom, which essentially says that if you have an algebra of a small neighborhood, of a Cauchy surface, then this should be isomorphic to sort of causal evolution, because in a sense, we want to be able to reconstruct things from initial data. So that's uh, also in the title of the paper. Yes, please. So are we, are we, only, are we only considering the computers, not the entire computers? No, this is, um, yeah. So, so this is an axiom. So this is a um, relation that, uh, well, these algebras have to uh, fulfill, but, um, well, an algebra has a product, and for this product, this relation has to hold. So we're not considering just the commutators, but the relation is that the commutator for, um, well, operators localized in disjoint regions, space like disjoint regions is zero. So that's just the condition but it doesn't mean that we are only considering that. 
Yes. I think the worry is uh, anti anti commutation relations. Oh, that was. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So again, this is for observables. Whereas um, fermions, we have a paper on fermions as well, but uh, like single fermion is not observable. So uh, this this holds only for observables. If you want to talk about, say, single fermions, uh, then they would naturally anti commute. Uh, but uh, yeah, but they are again not the primary object here. So um, so so for for say. Uh, fermionic system, you would think of these already as fermion anti fermion pairs. Uh, so yeah, just the observable objects. Was it was that was that your question? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Can I just yes. ask about the time slice action? Yes. If one thinks of a, a small neighborhood and open borders, yes. then this is not at all um, uh, to be expected. I mean, it looks to me like Rich Leader or something going on there. So. So, could you say a bit more about it? Why isn't this expected? Well, it is it's a quite expected. So it's an open ball. Yeah. It's a neighborhood of a Cauchy surface. Yeah. So it doesn't include the whole Cauchy surface at all. So no, no, neighborhood, it means it has to include the Cauchy surface oh, oh, as being see, a neighborhood. Sorry, sorry. Not, yeah, it has to be neighborhood of the whole thing. So then you have to take like the whole slice. So then I guess it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I think I draw a picture here, right? Um, yeah, so, so then you think like this is your whole space time, right? This, this is your Cauchy surface, and then this is the neighborhood. You might think it would include more than what's given by the operator algebra. Well, yeah, so you have, right, so you have A of sigma, right? This clearly is in A of M, right? But the statement is that A of sigma is already all of A of F, right? So you could have, in principle, you could have more observables in the larger uh, region, but um, the time size axiom says that everything is actually already isomorphic to the algebra of the smaller region if it contains uh, the full neighborhood of the Cauchy surface. So this is like classically you would say, well, we have the initial value problem, which is well posed. That's, that's what this should do. Okay, um, any more questions? Great. Uh, so there's more axioms, there's more where it came from, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on these because I think these are most physically relevant. And if you want to read the paper, these are the ones that we spend most time on. Um, okay, so let's go to curve space time. Uh, so all of this generalizes also to curve space time. And the sort of big uh, picture behind it is that we want to look at situations where um, GR effects are um, significant. So the curvature is large, uh, but the space time is still fixed. So the quantum gravity effects are not, not too huge. Um, so that's something in between. Uh, and this is essentially called QFT on curve space, then, right? And examples of applications, so early universe, so cosmological space times, um, black holes, so short shield care solutions, so putting quantum fields on, on such guys. Uh, so yeah, so, so then more generally, instead of assigning things to a fixed space time and its sub regions, uh, you can also say, oh, I want to assign an algebra to uh, all space times of a given class, class of nice space times, um, in kind of covariant way. So uh, this is going a step further. So you assign algebras to space times and algebra morphisms to uh, space time embeddings. Um, and this is called locally covariant quantum field theory. And um, if you are interested in this, this is great. Uh, it uses a lot of categories and factors. So if this is your kind of thing, then uh, yay. Uh, but, uh, it, I, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, but again, if you look at our paper, there are categories and factors. So everything can be phrased in that language as well. I like categories and factors. Um, 
Cool. So, but for now, for now, let's look at a concrete space time. So let's fix a space time and uh, choose a nice metric. And by nice, I mean globally hyperbolic, so that this picture with a Cauchy surface makes sense. So for a metric to be globally hyperbolic, for space time to be globally hyperbolic, it means that uh, there is a Cauchy surface. So, so that's a sort of minimal if I want to talk about, say, this time size axiom. Um, so these are the nice space times. Okay, nice space time. What else do I need? I need to specify what objects I'm going to study. So this is now in the constructing models uh, situation. Uh, I'm trying to construct that net of these algebras. Uh, so I need to know what I'm describing. So what kind of animals, so scalars, vectors, tensors, whatever. Um, and typically, uh, well, classically, my space of fields is the space of smooth sections of some vector one. Would be more general, but for this talk, let's focus on this situation. And here are some examples that you should be familiar with. So um, there's the scalar field, so this is just smooth functions. Um, there is the Young Mills theory, and here I wrote it uh, explicitly for the situation with a trivial bundle. So we have one forms on the space time value to some of the algebra, so H theories. Um, and we can also do effective quantum gravity where we look at um, the space of smooth uh, two forms. Um, and because I'm lazy, I'm always going to write the element of the configuration space as phi and completely suppress all the indices. So I try to keep the notation as slim as possible. Yes. Does this represent the uh, uh, I know the function you're testing your or uh, the, the observables? Uh, for for or? yeah, for now I'm this is classical. Okay. So this is the space of classical okay. fields. And before, because I haven't specified the dynamics yet, is the space of uh, classical offshell fields. So no dynamics, say all the scalar fields uh, on that space. Okay the dynamics. Um, so I'm going to use some modification of the Lagrangian formalism, uh, which is fully covariant. I don't want to break covariance. Covariance is great. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of intuitive if you know Lagrangian mechanics, but it's a bit different. So I will expand on it. So this is my physical input. This is what I get from a friendly physicist. And now I want to construct my theory. Any questions up to now? There was some, but yeah. Uh, why would you uh, take the smooth functions to be the configuration space? Or uh -huh. Because if you consider, if you have like a, even a free field theory, uh -huh. the configuration space that analyzes it contains distributions. Uh -huh. So it's very not smooth. So, so my, my observables are going to be distributions. Okay. So uh, this is a bit of, um, Oh, it's the duality between um, observables and uh, field configurations. So uh, observables are going to be functions of field configurations, and they can be crazy in some way. Um, so yeah, so uh, some of these choices are a bit out of laziness. So one could consider like uh, you know finite order of differentiability, but then there is a much more technically involved. So. It's actually good to just take smooth. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, talk about this particular construction of a net of sister algebras with that input. And uh, yeah, so this approach was proposed by Buchholz and Frenhagen in the paper from 2020, sister algebraic approach to interacting quantum field theory. So that was the start of that story. Um, and here's the main idea. So uh, you want to, assigned to your regions sister algebras, which are generated by some unitaries with relations that are motivated by um, the axioms of U of T. And where these unitaries come from? Okay, so there is an object in perturbative uh, quantum field theory called local S matrices. So these unitaries are going to, um, well, essentially be uh, 
non-perturbative version of um, local S matrices, which in turn are kind of a cutoff version of um, scattering matrices. So quantum field theory, you know, really lives off uh, scattering. So scattering matrix is something important. Local S matrices are, uh, well, I'm going to talk about it a bit more, but essentially, um, this is in the situation where you introduce some kind of cutoff to your interaction and you're localizing your interaction. And then the real true scattering metric would be some sort of a limit. But local S matrices are um, objects which are pretty well known in um, perturbative quantum field theory. And here we take that concept as a basis for the non perturbative treatment. Um, but the whole approach has very deep roots in perturbative AQFT. So this is something I've, I've been working on for a while. So uh, therefore, this is I think of this as a very nice connection between perturbative results and non-perturbative uh, setting, non-perturbative axiomatic framework. Um, okay, I hope some of it becomes more clear later. Yes. Just to comment on the S matrix, yeah. one normally thinks about it as giving you relationships between asymptotic states. Right. So when you say local S matrices, is that this... not involving? Yeah. yeah okay, let me uh, maybe draw something again. Um, I will say a bit more about it uh, later, but here is the thing. So uh, you imagine uh, interaction Lagrangian in quantum field theory. Um, it's something that should live everywhere. Um, however, um, let's give it a cutoff. So let F be some smooth compact supported function on M and we consider an interaction which is V, which is some Lagrangian density, um, say V of phi, it's some Lagrangian density smeared with that cutoff. So this is then an interaction where you introduce spatial and um, time-like cutoff. And then um, the S matrix will be uh, essentially uh, like an exponential of that uh, interaction. Um, so there's uh, a different product I have to use here. I will talk about it later, but this is a sneak preview. Um, so, the S matrix is an object which is localized, and this localization corresponds to my choice of um, cutoff for the interaction. Now, if I want to talk about the true S matrix, then I will have to take the limit F going to a constant function. So this is called the adiabatic limit. is adiabatic limit, and then you have the true S matrix. So, so that, that story is essentially um, the work of Epstein Glaser uh, in the 70s. They formulated that whole uh, framework. So, so yeah, it is related to, to, to the true S matrix, but it's not straightforward. And we are actually not going to be interested in that limit at all. This is Epstein. Glaser. And, and yeah, that story is, is perturbative. Um, okay, so that's just a preview. I will give more details to, to that. Um, okay, anything else at this point? Um, yeah, so as I said, classical observables are going to be uh, just functions on the space of configurations. And again, I take smooth because I'm lazy because I want to differentiate them and I don't want to stop differentiating for arbitrary reasons. So I just take all smooth functions. And because I'm fixing M, I'm just going to drop this M notation from everywhere. Um, localization. So this is an important thing because I want to assign things to regions. 
So here is the definition of the support. So this is the mathematical formula, but what it means is uh, the support of a functional tells me uh, that in that region, if I uh, perturb my uh, field configuration a little bit, then my functional knows about it. So this is essentially this condition that if I have a perturbation in the neighborhood of a given point in the support, then the functional feels the difference. So this is a very intuitive notion of support. Um, I'm also going to talk about local things a lot. And by local, I mean, uh, well, the usual definition in physics. So it can be written as uh, an integral of some uh, function alpha on uh, the jet space. So it's just a function of uh, the value of the field and its derivatives up to a fixed order. I should say that this goes up to fixed order. Um, yeah, and I would use this volume associated with the metric for these integrals, but if you're not comfortable with this, just think Minkowski space them and D4x as your integration measure. Um, and yeah, so most of the things I'm going to look at are of this form. So they are local functionals. Um, maybe a few words about calculus of variations so that I can maybe convince you that, that there is some uh, connection between uh, the more abstract stuff I'm talking about and sort of more down to earth calculations. Uh, so yeah, so there's some notation I'm using. So first of all, um, I'm going to consider derivatives. So here we have a derivative of a classical observable, so a functional of the field. So I can differentiate it with respect to that field. Um, well, the, the mathematical definition is uh, just this. So you take a difference portion and then take the limit. Um, yeah, actually, this is kind of important later on that um, all these derivatives uh, are essentially obtained from shifts so from applying uh, first a shift transformation, then comparing it with the initial uh, value of the functional before the shift, and then one over t and computing the limit. So being able to, to do shifts is actually part of being able to uh, differentiate. Um, and then if you want, you can, for, for local functionals, you can relate it to the usual variational calculus. So if you want to compute this, um, and you have your um, function alpha of um, the value of the field and these derivatives, then, then you do the usual stuff. So you compute uh, derivative with respect to the value of the function, the first derivative, the second derivative, and so on. So, so this is what people call variational derivative, or just the first two bits is Euler Lagrange derivative. So really the stuff from classical mechanics there's nothing uh, scary about it, uh, only we typically work on infinite dimensional spaces. Okay, so that's the sort of mathematical basis of various operations in classical theory. Uh, and now, yes? In order, in order to carry out the integration by parts, I think something take on the unit plus. Oh, oh yes, these are very, actually, these are very strong. <laughs> so alpha is compactly supported. So um, I should have mentioned this. So uh, like one, uh, one of the consequence of smoothness here is that, um, yeah, all these functionals are compactly supported. So, so yeah, so, so then compact support obviously vanishes at infinity. Yes, thank, thank you for that, yes. Um, right, and dynamics. So dynamics is also going to be important. Um, I mentioned a bit uh, the uh, need to uh, introduce cutoffs, so let me elaborate it a little bit more. So I want to do Lagrangian mechanics. So I have Lagrangian density, and uh, well, ideally I would like to integrate it over the whole space time. That won't work because these are non-compact, so this is nonsense. Uh, so to avoid such uh, problems and also to uh, nicely go around uh, Hack's theorem, which uh, is, well, 
is a theorem. So, so yeah, it's it's proven. It's true, right? But but it has certain assumptions. So, um, Hugg's theorem, if you don't know it, tells us that uh, well, the interaction picture doesn't work in quantum field theory. Um, but one of the assumptions is that uh, you need to consider interactions which are um, everywhere defined. So um, the easy way to go around it and do something like sort of interaction picture is to look at interactions with a couple. So that was actually Epstein's other motivation to, uh, well, in the sense to, to be able to go around that theorem. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still true, right? So it's just have to every no theorem is a yes go theorem, but you have to find a way around. <laughs> <laughs> and the cut, the cut up is just incorrect. Um, no, no. Ultraviolet problems are going to be dealt with uh, on on in a separate way. Yes. Uh, all right. So yeah. So I think. Uh, Smooth compactly supported function. This is my cutoff, and then I plug it. Uh, so I uh, multiply my Lagrangian density with that cutoff, and the whole thing is then my Lagrangian. So uh, here I have Lagrangian L with cutoff F as a function of the field phi. The first example, free scalar field, right? This is the, the Lagrangian density. This is the cutoff. Second example, Young Mills theory. Third example, um, that's the Ricci scalar. So this is uh, GR. So these are various Lagrangians one can have. Um, and well, there's maybe a slightly technical point that uh, given any local functional, actually I can obtain a generalized Lagrangian of this sort. I can always um, you know, multiply the argument with a cutoff and then I kind of put the cutoff uh, into my um, functional. So even if I start with something which um, doesn't look uh, like this, I can always construct it from local functionals. Okay, so generalized Lagrangians are Lagrangians with a cutoff. Um, and uh, here is the thing. So it would be very problematic for us if important dynamical information would depend on the choice of the cutoff. That would be bad. Um, but so, but let's see if it does. Um, and before I compute, uh, well, Euler Lagrange derivative, let me go a step back and compute the corresponding difference portion. So I shift my um, argument by uh, psi, which is compactly supported, subtract the value of my generalized Lagrangian. Uh, at unperturbed configuration. And now here's an important thing. I want to choose F, which is equal to one around the support of Psi. So here's the support of Psi. Here is the region, uh, the dashed line, where F is equal to one. And this is obviously contained in the support of F. Okay. Uh, now, because of locality, we are actually in a good place here. And uh, this, uh, object delta L, so this um, yeah, uh, shift of my Lagrangian by psi, this depends on psi, this depends on phi, but does not depend on the choice of the cutoff as long as the cutoff satisfies this condition. So it's one around uh, the support of psi. So here at this point, we already uh, got rid of the cutoff. And using this uh, shift, we can define all the Lagrange derivative. So something I denote by DL and uh, well, I form the difference portion, I take the limit, I get the derivative. And from this, well, I essentially get the equations of motion. So again, uh, I can write it um, for a local functional, I can write it uh, in terms of variational derivative. Uh, and then the equations of motion are um, the condition that uh, this dl, this derivative of l, uh, is equal to zero at a given phi. So phi is a solution if dl of phi equals zero. So this is the classical story. I have the classical equations of motion. Um, okay. And there is a technical condition here. So I assume that my equations are K 
kind of like wave equations. So um, I assume them to be normally hyperbolic. So think of uh, wave equations, think of uh, things that in the highest order of derivative look like the wave operator. Okay. Sorry, yes. Does that uh, preclude uh, elliptic initial value stuff? Or? I want to talk about hyperbolic stuff um, for now. Yeah. Uh, well, elliptic, uh, yeah, elliptic things would probably make more sense in um, Euclidean signature, right? So in, I would say that in Lorentzian signature, um, hyperbolic is the nicest, uh, as nice as it gets, um, because you really want to have um, well well defined initial value problem and some kind of propagation uh, for for the solution. So so that yeah, you you can some of these things you can do in Euclidean signature, but then it's a different story. No, no it's, the question is yes, uh, hyperbolic is. To define the evolution, yeah. but then it can be really used to find initial data. Initial data, yeah. Exactly. Well, you can have you can have um, a version with constraints, so you can have things which are hyperbolic uh, uh, upon gauge fixing. So, so, so there, there is there is some generalization of that, uh, but in. At the end of the day, you, you want to put yourself in some normally hyperbolic situation, but potentially restricting your uh, Cauchy data or doing some gauge fixing. So, uh, are, we, yes. are we maintaining the covariance structure with your introducing the problem? Uh, yes, the, well, yes. Uh, so, first of all, well, this object here doesn't depend on the cutoff. So equations of motion don't know the cutoff. And um, yeah, that's fully covariant. There is nothing, there's nothing here breaking covariance. So the only thing would be uh, the cutoff, but at this point, I'm already independent of the cutoff. So um, yeah, the, the derivative doesn't depend on the cutoff and we are only interested in derivative. And, um, there's a severe restriction on the cutoff. Like you have to modify the problem every time you write the group. Well, no, no. Um, so, so you, you hear Lagrangian is a map from cutoffs to local functionals. So, and then given that map, you define uh, this uh, variation as follows. So, so. Um, yeah, so, so the Lagrangian is a map, so it knows about every cutoff. It's a map from cutoffs to local functionals. And then the variation uh, doesn't depend on the cutoffs anymore. So this is just another object. This is a map on size and phi's, uh, which uses L in a way, but not in a way which cares about the cutoff. Does it make sense? Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Um, technically, fifteen minutes, but you have had many questions, so. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, okay. Well, as I said, I I have um, I have material for for more than one seminar, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let's see, let's see as far how far do we get? Um, right, so uh, so that that's dynamics and because the talk is partially about symmetry so here are the symmetries uh, and in the first instance i want to think of infinitesimal symmetries so these are um well so i have my space of configurations and i look at symmetry transformations which um, infinitesimally corresponds to um, vector fields so you can think of these as directions in my configuration space. And, and here is a finite dimensional picture to help your intuition. So if I had uh, a vector field X acting on the function F on the finite dimensional space, I could write it in coordinates like this. Um, so in our uh, infinite dimensional situation, uh, I can also write it in a similar way by contracting uh, the functional derivative with uh, the value of the vector field at a given point. 
So uh, we have nicely behaving vector fields as well. Uh, so you can say what the symmetry is in that setting. So infinitesimally, a symmetry is a direction in which Lagrangian, oh dear, there's a typo, I'm sorry, uh, in which Lagrangian is constant. So if I contract the derivative of the Lagrangian with that vector field, I get identically zero. So that's symmetries. Um, okay, now uh, Nettles theorem tells us that to, to such uh, symmetries, I can associate um, conserved currents and hence uh, conserved charges. So, so there is some gadget I can extract out of a symmetry classically, and uh, these then show up uh, in the quantum theory in uh, various ways. So I want to build up my story from now on about quantization, which in the end should lead to uh, answering the question, uh, what happens with these conserved currents and conserved charges in the quantum theory? So where do we find them um, in the quantization? So I need to do quantization. This is actually very easy now. So I, I did so much work in the classical theory so that the quantization is going to be easy. So uh, yeah, quantization is going to be by abstract nonsense, which is my favorite way of quantizing <laughs> things. Uh, you know, it's a, it, should, it should be a valid quantization method. Um, yeah, so let, let's start maybe with enriching my space then with a bit more extra structure. So in our paper, we talk about dynamical space stamps. And this is essentially a space stamp plus uh, a Lagrangian. So we want to uh, start with some Lagrangian and then build the theory where we uh, perturb this Lagrangian with various interaction terms. So a dynamical space stamp is space stamp plus Lagrangian some technical conditions. Uh, and then there is a space of local functionals on it, uh, which are nice because they preserve causal structure and everything. Um, sorry, they preserve global hyperbolicity. And uh, among those, uh, so from these local functionals, I can think of them as interaction terms. So I have a given space time, given Lagrangian, and then the class of allowable interactions that essentially don't ruin my global hyperbolicity and which are well-behaving interaction terms. Um, so, so, so yes, yeah, so, so, so th these are going to be key objects in my theory. So this is really going to be a sister algebra of interactions. Uh, or in other words, of perturbations of a given Lagrangian. So here we are. So here is a quantization by abstract nonsense. So uh, there is a there is an easy way of, of constructing sister algebras, right? So so the easiest way of constructing a sister algebra is say, well, here are the generators, okay, and I take uh, the sister algebra generated by those. So I give you, uh, well set of unitaries. So um, in this example, I say that to every interaction, I uh, assign a generator. So these are going to be unitaries in my sister algebra. There is some normalization condition. And uh, yeah, that's a sister algebra, OK? Uh, but obviously, it's too big because it doesn't satisfy any of the nice relations we want it to satisfy in quantum field theory. So here is the first relation we want, which is the causality relation. So um, yeah, uh, there was a causality in terms of these commutators. Now I'm showing you something which looks very different. So uh, how, how do I explain myself? So there are um, three interaction terms here, F, G, and H. And now I'm saying, uh, well, essentially uh, that the support of F uh, comes later than the support of G. So let me draw a picture again. Okay. Yes. So 
I have a functional localized here. Sorry, it's called the H. Being silly again. Okay. So, support, so there is H, F, A, uh, are separated by some Cauchy surface. So this comes later than that. And G is something else. Okay, G can be, say, here or anywhere. Nothing depends on G here. And now uh, the causality relation tells me that uh, the S matrix or the sum of these guys factorizes into these three pieces. So F plus G to the minus one, two plus H. This might look strange, but uh, let's assume that G equals zero. Zero is a good, good functional. Zero is a great number. I mean, there are people like building their whole careers on, on considering zero. So let's, let's do that. And, and then what does it say here? So I say S of, F plus H is S of F times S of H. Okay, that's good. Now, what happens if these two guys were space-like? So let me draw a slightly different picture. So if H is space-like, okay, then it's true that F is not later than H, and H is not later than F, is their space length. So it's also true that this factorizes the other way. So in other words, comparing those two, well, you know, addition is one of the things which are commutative. So these are equal, hence we can conclude that S of H commutes with S of F if they're space length. So this property actually here, locality, uh, does imply uh, you know, causality in the sense I said before, but it's slightly more general. So, yes? What do you need the G for? Um, the G is here for G for generality. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, so you can always uh, split, so you cannot always split things this way that you have two disjoint things, but very often you can split things three ways. Because um, here that worked only if F and H were disjoint supports. Uh, but if you cannot really separate things this way, you might want to use partition of unity, which you can split everything three ways, right? Using partition of unity. And then the key thing is that, you know, this works with whatever is in the middle. So that's the main idea, axiom one. Um, axiom two is the dynamics. And this has something to do with this shift operation. So uh, it's not that intuitive on, on the first side, uh, but uh, okay, so this is this uh, shift operation on the Lagrangian, and this is the shift operation of some observable. And uh, this relates a uh, shifted uh, argument, so shifted interaction, shifted base Lagrangian to the situation where nothing was changed. And uh, that actually uh, implies some sort of, uh, well, realization of equations of motion. So you can think of this uh, relation as uh, the finite version of dynamics. So this really, in a sense, encodes some of the information about the equations of motion. So this is Buchholz Frenhagen algebra. This is how uh, they formulated things. So you take a sister algebra generated by your interactions and quotient by these two relations. Um, uh, yes. In what sense is it called functional? What is, uh, sorry? In what sense is, it, is this dynamic relation called functional? Ah, on shell. Okay. Um, yeah. By on shell, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, so on the space of solutions. So, so these are all, um, yeah. So, so on shell is usually the um, term that relates to the space of solutions. And here uh, it says that uh, 
this relation has something to do with implementing the dynamics. So um, yeah, if you were to realize it uh, in a setting where everything is also constructed out of functionals, um, then these would be functionals on the space of solutions. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the onshore bit of it. But yeah, you, you can read it without it. This is more uh, sort of connecting with other formulations, but th the relation is what it is. Onshore is just a name uh, referring to uh, having something to do with solution space. Okay, um, that's the definition. So that's very good. Uh, I would like to ask for an extra five minutes, please. <laughs> Sorry to keep you for so long. Um, yeah, so I want to say maybe something about the motivation from perturbative AQFT because I already mentioned it with Epstein Glaser. Uh, but then again, I don't want to go too much into this. This is maybe something for discussion. So uh, the context where you can uh, motivate those axioms and, uh, well, sort of perturbative version of these axioms. Uh, arises in uh, PAQFT, in epstein gasser normalization. Uh, so you consider a situation where your base Lagrangian is quadratic and your interactions are not, okay? So this is the usual situation in perturbation theory. There are some nice uh, globally, sorry, normally hyperbolic equations underlying it. You have a bunch of really nice stuff. You know, you have propagators. You, you have the Feynman propagator. So um, this is again something you might have heard or seen in quantum field theory. Um, and with this Feynman propagator, you can uh, construct things like time-ordered products. So um, again, uh, here I have. Uh, some functionals which correspond to my interaction times and computing their time ordered products is a uh, thing that one actually does quite a lot in uh, quantum field theory. So you contract things with the Feynman propagators. You take derivatives, then contract it with the Feynman propagator. Um, and so, so these kind of funny products uh, are uh, then in quantum field theory, a sort of expansion of the S matrix. So, so these are um, also called green functions. So, so these are coefficients in the expansion of the S matrix. And these are the, the beautiful thing, but also a very problematic thing in quantum field theory. So these objects, these time ordered products are well defined as long as their arguments are with disjoint support. But terrible things happen if we consider things with coinciding support. Why? Because Feynman propagator is really singular. So we don't want to have to like square a Feynman propagator uh, or you know have loops with the Feynman <laughs> propagator. And because this is the source of singularities, this is the source of divergences in quantum field theory. That thing about Feynman propagator. So what did Epstein and Glaser do? So they say, well, let's avoid those coinciding points for a minute and let's see if we can find any sensible formula for those TNs, which would you know, agree with this Feynman propagator everywhere outside the coinciding subplots, but uh, doesn't have those nasty singularities. So this is Epstein Glaser renormalization. They showed that yes, you can construct those TNs. Um, there is some distributional extension story behind it. Uh, however, there is a relation that you have to uh, be able to uh, implement for each of these TNs, uh, which is called causal factorization. And it essentially uh, guarantees that your uh, end result uh, satisfies uh, this, well, factorization property I showed before. Yes. What's the state? Um, this is this is for the moment no state is specified. Uh, don't, so don't you need any state for the atom of renormalization? Um, no, actually, because in the first instance you can do it on the level of functionals. So you can do it 
on the level of algebra. Uh, but then you have nice states like evaluation. So if you evaluate everything at zero, you have a state. So there are very nice states here, um, but that story is still state independent. Okay, uh, so let me cut to the chase. Uh, using those time ordered products, you can then uh, realize S matrices as time ordered exponentials. So that was in the sneak preview at the beginning. Um, and this story is perturbed, okay? So, so, so everything has H bar and, you know, um, you compute things up to a given order, uh, these series don't necessarily converge. Um, but you can think of, of that construction as a sort of perturbative version of uh, the abstract story I uh, presented before. So uh, in a sense, right, you, 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 have, you have a good indication that the objects you're trying to describe should behave uh, somewhat like uh, these, these abstract as matrices because their perturbative counterparts do uh, behave this way. Okay. Um, so, and then, as I said, the causal factorization property uh, implies that um, for the supports. Okay, um, I don't want to go too long. I will just skip to the end and state the result. Is that okay? Uh, so anyway, so, so this is the connection to more real world. Um, so let me just cut to the chase. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so there is, sorry. So there is some story about the symmetries uh, here. Okay. Uh, so there is the third axiom. Uh, so I stated two axioms and slightly motivated them by that pertur perturbative story. But there is a third axiom, which is something we introduced in this paper, uh, uh, the recent one on symmetries. So if you want to talk about symmetries and if you want to uh, talk about renormalization in this abstract setting, well, first thing, yes, you can talk about renormalization in this abstract setting. So you can uh, introduce a renormalization group acting on, on these uh, sister algebras. And then uh, there is another axiom which we call unitary mass toward identity, which tells us how these S matrices transform under symmetries. And what we require is that under a symmetry transformation, the S matrix can only be changed by uh, a certain renormalization group element, which then depends on the symmetry in question. So this is a transformation law telling us uh, how symmetry transformations on the left-hand side should relate to renormalization group transformations on the right. Um, and yeah, so here is uh, an interpretation of that. So in particular, if I, uh, don't perturb at all, um, then uh, this special case of uh, the unitary, sorry, uh, what they call it unitary anomalous master word identity. Uh, the special case of that tells me just uh, how uh, the S matrix itself uh, would transform. So in a sort of path integral language, it tells us how the path integral measure would transform. So uh, these renormalization group transformations can be related in path integral formulation to uh, the Jacobian of the symmetry. So this is uh, part of the motivation or in uh, something I really care about, the BV setting, these are related to the BV Laplacian. So um, these are the, two natural ways to, um, well, in a sense, motivate uh, these uh, renormalization group transformations. And in that setting, we have uh, shown um, that, uh, well, if a symmetry is unbroken, so if that renormalization group transformation on the right-hand side is trivial, then, uh, well, uh, 
this symmetry transformation can be unitary implemented and the unitary in question can then be seen as the exponential of the Nutter chart. So our version of the Nutter theorem uh, says that for unbroken symmetry, so for symmetries that survive in this quantum algebra without a change by randomization group element, you have this night unitary implementation by the charges. Um, so yeah, so as I said, so the classical symmetries uh, can survive um, the quantization. So then we don't need this renormalization group change, but also uh, we can make sense of the broken symmetry. So a symmetry is broken if it needs to be corrected by a renormalization group element. So we can think of these as like honest to goodness quantum symmetries. Uh, and uh, well, you can, in the sense in physics, interpret these renormalization uh, group transformations as kind of uh, anomalies because that's the obstruction of preserving uh, the classical symmetry. Um, and as I said, uh, for unbroken symmetries, we have uh, this version of the Nutter theorem with implementing symmetry transformations by unitaries. But what's maybe even more interesting and uh, slightly surprising uh, that for the broken symmetries, you also have some sort of unitary implementation, but then it's more complicated and it takes into account this correction by uh, a randomization group element. So um, I think I took enough of your time. Uh, so let me finish now and uh, let's discuss. Thanks so much for a great talk. We'll take a few minute break and then have Q&A. Cool.